All right. Thanks, everybody, everybody, for joining the Plan Mecca Digital Mastery Series. My name is Jody Rodney, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Education for Plan Mecca USA. Today uh, with us, we have Dr. Anthony Manito from the Medical University of South Carolina, and his highly anticipated topic is Onlays and Inlays, a Better Restorative Option. Uh, before we get started, I do have a few housekeeping items. Um, obviously, um, all attendees are muted and your video is not on, so enjoy yourself uh, in your pajamas with your cup of coffee or tea, whatever whatever your, uh, <laughs> your style is. Um, if you're having any technical issues, please submit them via the chat feature. Uh, if you have questions for Dr. Manito, please submit them via the Q&A. Uh, we will take time at the end of the presentation to open it up for questions. Uh, we will also post the CE survey via chat um, following his presentation as we start the Q&A. Um, it will also be included in your post uh, webinar email along with a recorded version of the webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Manito. Thank you, Jody. <clears throat> um, Y'all will have to bear with me a little bit. I've, I've been getting over a cold for like the past two weeks. Um, and so my, my throat's a little scratchy. I, I, a cough uh, every now and then if that happens just uh just ignore it uh, i should get over it relatively soon i have a cough drop ready to go just in case uh, of an emergency but i want to thank uh you all for joining us out there um thank plan mecca for giving me a platform to talk about one of my favorite topics uh, and that is partial coverage restorations um so without further ado let's get rolling um, I call this save the enamel because um, man, I think I think that's a really important thing to do in modern dentistry. We we know all about the ability to bond to enamel, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But um, you know, we a big part of uh, this process is changing our mindset a little bit um, to look at teeth in a different way to try to be more conservative. And and um, I think one of the ways that we can do that is by doing it with CAD CAM. I'm thinking, was was talking to someone earlier today about how I think COVID is actually going to be beneficial for people with CAD CAM systems because, um, you know, patients aren't going to want to go to the dental office um, for multiple visits if they can, if they can help it. And dentists aren't going to want to necessarily you know, fork out for the PPE that is required for multiple visits to do a single unit um, of Crown and Bridge. So, you know, the times are changing. I think uh, a lot of things are going to be different coming out of this um, this pandemic. Um, and I think CAD CAM will be something that will be maybe a little more popular, which I actually think is is a good thing. So, um, we'll try to find any silver lining we can out of this uh, out of this horrible couple of months that we've had. But uh, thanks for joining us. Um, the objectives today, first thing I want to talk about are some foundational ideas. Um, all of this is kind of a conceptual change in the way of thinking, uh, the way the way of doing dentistry, right? We all have the different, our different clinical uh, philosophies that we use, um, but there are some foundational ideas that are a, a big part of that that are not necessarily part of this conversation today. Um, but things that we need to make sure we're doing correctly because our success, the success of these restorations is going to count on us doing those um, at the highest level. And then I'll make a little more sense here in a moment. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about materials because I think materials are always important when you're talking about doing um, any sort of restoration. The material choices we have today are fantastic. It's nice to have choices, but it's also nice to have materials that have been around for a while and are tried and true and have been tested uh, in these clinical scenarios for a long time. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And of course, we're going to talk about preparations. And I want to give you some strategies for how to critically think your way through partial coverage restorations, because it's not like doing a crown, right? Every, every crown prep you do on tooth number 19 could look exactly the same. That's not the case with the partial coverage. Every onlay is going to look different. Every inlay is going to look different. We'll talk a little bit about overlays. Those may all look different as well. Um, and there's a certain amount of critical thinking that needs to happen. Um, each tooth is different. Each clinical situation is different. And so your approach um, needs to have almost like a cookbook uh, mentality as you go through to try to figure out what exactly is going to be best for, for that tooth. 
a couple of things, a couple of housekeeping notes uh, to start with. Um, I do have a few partnerships with some companies, Plan Mecca being one of them. Um, however, I was using Plan Mecca products before they were Plan Mecca products. Um, I actually started this CAD CAM journey back in 2010 uh, with my good friend and mentor, Wally Renee. Um, we were using the E4D system, CART system, back when the very first intraoral impression that I took took me 35 minutes. Um, you know, the learning curve for that CAD CAM system was was quite a bit higher than than what we find now. So the the technology has gotten far better. The learning curve is is um, far shorter. Um, so the usability of these systems is actually quite fantastic. Um, another thing is I I am not a, a big proponent or user of zirconia. Um, like I said, I've been doing CAD CAM for, um, for a decade and, you know, I have done fine with Emacs and other materials, um, have not had issues with fracture. I'll talk a little bit about why that would be uh, as we go through this. Um, but when zirconia came along and really came into fashion, it was, it was a solution for a problem that I didn't have. Um, so I really don't, don't really talk too much about zirconia. Um, and uh, yeah, that's probably the last you'll hear of it uh, today. Uh, I am very, very fortunate to, to work at a university that has a ton of great technology. Um, we have a bunch of different systems, a lot of different types of mills, a lot of different types of scanners. Um, and it's, it's, I'm very fortunate to be here. It, gets, it allows me to compare um, side by side different systems and so I know kind of what works and what what doesn't work and the reality is all this technology works very well um, but the one piece of technology that I want to highlight in this is the mill uh, I think milling is one <clears throat> piece of technology that hasn't really become mainstream yet in office milling hasn't hasn't quite gotten to the point of mainstream acceptance um, but when you when you Think about what it can do for you. Um, you know, you should really seriously consider whether it could be a part of your practice. Um, obviously, it eliminates temporaries and all the hassles that come along with those. Um, and eliminating that that second delivery visit is a is a big deal as well. Um, especially nowadays, once again, well, I'm, we're, we in South Carolina are starting to get back to work and we're starting to realize the tremendous amount of PPE that we go through in the course of a day. Um, and any way you can, you can try to minimize, right, the cost and the, and the you know, obviously it's kind of a pain to, to take that PPE off and on multiple times a day. Um, that anything, anytime you can minimize that, I think it's beneficial. We'll talk about some other ways that the mill is, is I think, a, a, a key part of um, a modern dental practice um, and also how it really, really helps you to do more conservative dentistry, which is obviously the focus of today. So let's talk about a few other foundational concepts. Uh, like I said, these are all really important pieces of the puzzle that are not necessarily the the prep itself or the material but things that go along with being successful doing partial coverage dentistry uh, and one and first and foremost is your mindset um, you know we all went to dental school at one point we were all taught something called retention form and retention form is this idea that the shape of the tooth is going to keep a a restoration on with maybe a little a little help from a cement or something along those lines but the reality is that retention form often requires you to remove a lot of additional healthy tooth structure that, that wouldn't otherwise need to be removed. Um, and so this, this is, you know, this in my, in my mind is an issue, uh, especially nowadays. You know, back when I was in dental school, I graduated in 2003, we had PFM and we had gold and we needed retention form because we had, you know, I was, man, I was mixing zinc phosphate back then to put my gold crowns on. Um, and if you had retention form, that stuff worked. Uh, but the reality is we have much better materials now uh, and we are able to do much more conservative dentistry because of that. But you need to change your mindset just a little bit. And part of that is the dental school curriculum. Now, I'm a dental school instructor. I teach fixed pros. Um, and we have a pretty forward thinking dental curriculum here. I think we're, we're quite modern in our approach. However, when I, when I really step back and look at 
the percentages of what we teach in our fixed price curriculum, you know, we spend three semesters talking about crown preps and teaching crown preps. Guess how long we spend talking about partial coverage? About two thirds of a semester. So we shouldn't be surprised when the first thought that comes to a student's mind or a dentist's mind when a tooth needs a indirect restoration is a crown because that is what we are teaching the most of. Okay, does that make sense? And it's kind of the same idea that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. All right, it's the same idea. We need, we need to increase the number of tools in our toolbox. All right, because yes, we have that hammer. We can always do crowns, right? Crowns are, are some of the simplest restorations to do, but they're also the most destructive. And so we need to add more tools to that toolbox. And I love showing this case because this is a really good case to illustrate my point. This is a, a case that I, that I put up on my uh, Instagram account uh, where the patient had just a small, um, basically a clusal amalgam that had been in there for 25 or 30 years, uh, but was starting to have symptoms of a cracked tooth. Uh, and when we put the tooth sleuth on it, we found that that distolingual cusp was in fact fractured. Now you have a patient who comes in and they have a cracked tooth. What do you usually do? You usually do a crown, right? Well, in this case, look how much healthy tooth structure we have compared to the part of the tooth that is actually diseased or, you know, uh, in need of repair. Um, so, you know, instead of doing a full coverage crown, doing a small onlay um, fixes the problem, does so in a much more conservative way. Uh, and the patient was thrilled thrilled about this solution when you talk to them and you educate them about this um, they love the idea of being more conservative and and they don't they don't want you to take away all that healthy tooth structure um, so this is a big part now the most difficult part of this procedure was delivering this tiny piece of ceramic so it is not i'm not telling you that these are easy procedures to accomplish there is a bit of a learning curve you have to come up with strategies for placing small uh, ceramic restorations onto posterior teeth, um, but it's doable. And it's just, it's something that if you take the time to learn is definitely gonna be beneficial for your patients. Now, how is this restoration gonna stay in place? It's gonna stay in place by bonding. And bonding is a huge part of um, your success as far as these partial coverage restorations go. And I always talk about bonding in simple terms, right? Because it's a very complex thing. But simply put, we are prepping a tooth to maximize how much enamel we have available, right? That is our strategy. And you'll see as we go through this, that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to maximize how much enamel we have for bonding. Therefore, we need to make sure we are bonding to it in the best, most durable fashion we can. And if you look through the literature, if you look through all the data we have, what that means is using phosphoric acid to etch enamel, all right? A lot of us, me included, love self-etch products, okay? I love it because you don't have to worry about dent hypersensitivity. Um, they're very convenient. I think they're, they're less technique sensitive than total etch products. However, once again, looking at the literature, they just don't bond as well or as durably to enamel as we need for these types of restorations. And so I personally use Adhes Universal, which is a universal all-in-one adhesive system. That's what we use here at the school. And we use it in the selective etch technique, meaning we are taking phosphoric acid and we are selectively etching um, our enamel. And I think that is a very good kind of a um, combination of doing things efficiently, but still getting really good results. So make sure you're, you're if you're going to go to all the trouble to save that enamel, make sure we're doing um, the best we can to bond durably to it. Hey, Dr. Menino. Isolation. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but there seems to be a black box on your upper right-hand corner of your presentation that's blocking. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Fixed. Is it gone? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, so isolation is a big part of this. Obviously, if we're relying on bonding for um, these restorations to stay in place, we need to make sure we're, we're getting really good isolation. Um, that's difficult to do for full coverage crowns. Um, you'll see that with a lot of these uh, strategies that we put in place for 
um, these partial coverage restorations that using something like a rubber dam is actually a lot more feasible than it would be for a full coverage restoration. Uh, over this break, I've, I've taken the, um, the rubber dam course by Kalen Pop, which I highly recommend. It's, it's about $100. It's all online. It's fantastically done, and it's a really nice review of how to, how to use um, you know, rubber dam for, for fantastic isolation. Um, I also think that coming out of this coronavirus uh, pandemic, there's been this um, emphasis on, on aerosols and trying to limit uh, aerosol spread. And the ADA has recommended the use of rubber dam as a strategy for limiting uh, the mixing of saliva with those aerosols. Um, and so that's going to be something that is going to be um, probably a little more popular moving forward as well. So isolation is a big part of this as well. We, our students use, um, use an ISOVAC, by the way, uh, in our student clinic, and that works very well also for isolation. Um, and then the last piece of this is, is documentation. Uh, documentation is very important from an insurance standpoint. Unfortunately, a lot of times our insurance companies don't love to um, cover partial coverage restorations. And so documentation is a big part of of what you can do as a dentist to make sure your patients get coverage for these types of restorations. Um, so I take a lot of photos. I take a ton of intraoral photos. Um, here's a couple of cases that I worked on just before this break. Take a pre-op photo, show you know fractures. This, this case on the lower left, we've got some fractures out the marginal ridge uh, and out of the lingual. Uh, this case on the right, there are obviously signs of some occlusal uh, bruxism and some fractures as well. Um, this sort of thing is all, are all beneficial strategies for just showing the insurance company that, you know, this, this uh, procedure was in fact necessary. If you think back to that little occlusal amalgam um, that I showed you, that case where I did the small onlay, if I were to show a bite wing, if I were to send that bite wing to the insurance company and said this patient needed an onlay, you know, that bite, bite wing doesn't really tell much of a story, but that pre-op photo really, really gives a different, um, a different explanation. And this is, we actually ended up doing onlays on both of these teeth. Uh, this, this one on the left is a student case that we did in our CAD CAM clinic. And the one on the right is, um, is one that we did in my, in my practice, private practice. So a couple of onlays. Um, just to show you that I, I do, in, in fact, practice what I preach. These are, these are some of my favorite restorations to do. Uh, and then I always, always send a little bit of a narrative with, um, with these as well, just letting the insurance company know kind of what I saw um, and that I'm trying to, to do as, as conservative uh, dentistry as I can. Um, and generally, we don't have any issues with the insurance company um, covering these, these claims uh, with all the, all the evidence that we're sending them, um, really showing them that we're doing our due diligence here. Well, how well do these partial coverage restorations work? Well, looking at the literature, this is a, um, a systematic review and a meta-analysis done in 2016, uh, looking at 10-year survival rate. And the, the survival rate's really good. 91% for 10 years, I think, is something that we all could live with, um, that type of percentage. Um, fracture was the principal mode of failure. Now, this was done in 2016, meaning that it's a mixture of different materials. Before Emacs came along, um, Empress and Feldspathic porcelain were the, were the popular materials for these restorations. And those fall you know, somewhere underneath 200 megapascals of strength whereas Emacs is 450 to 500 megapascals of strength. So uh, if you're getting the principal mode of uh, fracture failure for some of these, likely they were using uh, weaker materials. Uh, Emacs has been around now for, um, for about 12 years, um, and we have a lot of clinical data on it, which is fantastic. This is a, a, one of my favorite studies, actually, looking at the clinical performance of uh, occlusal onlays. So there's a lot of different terms for uh, a full coverage conservative crown preparation. Occlusal onlays is one of them. Um, and what these are, very minimally prepped, um, complete coverage restorations that are about a millimeter thick. 
but bonded to the two structure. So you can see in these preparations just how much enamel we have around the periphery of those preparations. Um, and you know, once again, if you use great, if you have great isolation, if you use proper bonding protocols, you get fantastic uh, survival rates. And and sure enough, in this study, 100% uh, survival rate with an average of about eight years. So we still have a ways to go um, to really to to get to the the amount of clinical data that we have on on gold and things like that. But but Emacs in practice for the last 12 years has been every bit as good as we could have hoped it would be, uh, especially for for how efficient it is and it, how it allows us to to fit basically everything that we need from um, beginning to delivery in about a two hour or 90 minute appointment uh, really makes for efficient dentistry uh, if you have a, a chair side mill. And so once again, I've talked a bit about Emacs, but I will say that I bond 99% of my Emacs into place. <clears throat> the strength of Emacs is such that the manufacturer says that you can in fact uh, cement it using an RMGI and that is true. However, you need greater thickness of material in order to do that successfully. So being that we're doing more conservative dentistry, we want to be as conservative as possible. And with those thinner um, uh, thicknesses of ceramic material, we need to make sure that we are supporting it with uh, the bonded uh, restoration. So. Um, that's a very, very big part of this procedure is making sure that we are bonding our restorations. And there are a lot of benefits to bonding of ceramics. We've already talked about the fact that it allows for more conservative preparations. We don't need traditional retention and resistance form in our preparations. We can do, you know, basically un unretentive preps, and I'll show you some examples of those preps that would, would make my, um, my dental school instructors have a coronary probably if they, if they saw them. But the reality is it's a, it's, a different, it's a different age, right? We have adhesive dentistry. We know exactly what our materials are capable of. Uh, and we're able to prep uh, accordingly and get really, really good results um, with those strategies. It also increases the strength of the ceramic. So a lot of people talk about zirconia and how strong zirconia is. Um, I said I wasn't going to mention zirconia again, but here, here it is. The, the reality is um, I've had more zirconia failures over the course of the last five years, and I don't even do that much zirconia than I have Emacs, uh, and that's because of the difference in delivery, right? We, we feel like zirconia is strong enough where we can just cement it with an RMGI. Um, with Emacs, bonding it actually increases the strength of uh, the ceramic. So, you know, Inherently, it has a strength of about 500 megapascals. That strength goes up even further once it's bonded because it's being, it's being supported by the underlying tooth structure and the, um, and the resin cement. So that's a real big advantage. And then it allows for what I call flexibility of fit. So the reality is for every restoration, crown, onlay, uh, any indirect restoration, where the margin and the finish line come together, there's always a degree of misfit right? Nothing is ever perfectly sealed. There's always some sort of misfit there. And generally, it's not much. It's maybe less than 100, 100 microns or even less than 50 microns if you have a really well-fitting restoration. However, the fact that there is a gap there means that something needs to fill that gap. And if you have a bonded uh, ceramic restoration and, and you do a great job bonding that restoration into place, you're going to have basically a filling, filling that, uh, a bonded composite filling, filling that, you know, 30, 50, 100 micron gap, um, and it's going to stay sealed versus an RMGI that will wash out of that gap over time, allowing bacteria and things to get into that space and cause recurrent decay or gingival irritation or whatever it might be. Um, and then, you know, looking, looking at the, the literature as we always do, this is an older study, but basically the conclusion that they came up with uh, was that bonding has been shown to increase the clinical success of uh, all ceramic restoration. So you're gonna get better results by bonding your uh, ceramics into place. Now, there are other options other than Emacs, and I want you to, to have the impression that Emacs is the only thing 
that you can use. Uh, and there are actually some no oven options. And these are nice from a standpoint of efficiency. Obviously, if we're looking at the workflow for Emacs, Emacs has to go and through a crystallization cycle that takes anywhere from 14 and a half minutes to 25 minutes. Um, generally, if you do a speed cycle, which I think most of us do, it's about 14 and a half minutes. So it's not that long. But if you don't want to wait, if you're in a rush, if you, there are opportunities to use materials that don't require an oven cycle. Um, and the one that's been around for the longest is Empress. Empress has been around now for a couple of decades and Empress is actually a very pretty material and there's a high success rate using Empress uh, in inlays and onlays. I know a lot of my colleagues who are very high on Empress for those restorations, they will hand polish them rather than glazing and, and putting them in the oven. And, in, and hand polished bonded in Empress restoration, bonded to enamel is a very durable restoration. It's not as strong as Emacs, um, but it, once again, if you have good tooth structure to help support that restoration, uh, you're gonna have clinical success there. Some of these newer materials like Enamic and the Nice Block are, are a little bit uh, untested, so I hesitate to recommend them. Matter of fact, I would not recommend Enamic because we did have some experiences with those and we did have some fractures. Uh, it's a nice material in theory, but in practice, it, it just didn't work very well in, in our hands. Um, the composite blocks like Tetric CAD and Sarah Smart are really good time savers and really fantastic for inlays. I think those for me are my go-to materials for inlays and small onlays. Um, and then as I get a little bit um, larger, as far as the size of the onlays, uh, I will pick either Empress, depending on the occlusion in the case, or Emacs. Um, I try to stick with ceramics for those bigger, bigger cases. One thing that I have to stress is all of these materials are bonded differently. Different protocols for bonding. Some of them require sandblasting. Some of them you absolutely should not sandblast. So it's really important to read the directions for the individual material. Don't just assume because it comes out of your mill that it's going to be delivered exactly like Emacs uh, or exactly like Feldspathic or whatever it is that you're used to using. So really important to read the directions as always for whatever material you happen to be using. All right, finally, we can get into preparations a little bit. Check the time here. All right, let's start by talking about inlays. And inlays, they're kind of the tough, the toughest of all the restorations, I think. Tough from a few standpoints. I think it's a tougher prep, it's a tough prep. All right, this is a prep that a lot of our dental students struggle with. Um, internally, there's a lot of little nooks and crannies and areas where undercuts can hide, particularly because most of these involve a proximal surface. So down in the, in the box, um, it's very easy to get an undercut and that can really derail the whole whole procedure. Um, but when do you think, when do you start thinking about um, inlays? You, well, you start thinking about them when the buccolingual isthmus width of the prep it starts to get a little bit greater than two millimeters. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at a case. This was a, a, a couple of failing composites uh, and if we measure the isthmus areas, both of these areas are over two millimeters. Now, what, why is this two millimeter number important? Well, first of all, Sturdivant's Art and Science of Operative Dentistry is the, the Bible on uh, operative dentistry. It's what I was taught with. It's what we teach our students here with. Um, very, very good textbook, but they, they state two millimeters. Looking through the literature, taking a more modern approach to it, um, if you look at the longevity of composite restorations placed in, in um, preparations that are wider than two millimeters buccolingually, you get a dramatic decrease in the longevity of those. So the wider that occlusal surface gets, uh, because of some of the weaknesses of composite materials, particularly shrinkage and shrinkage stress, um, for those reasons, the longevity of these tends to be very poor. And so when this isthmus area starts to get a little wider, I think it's worth having a conversation with your patient about some other options that are available, indirect options. Now, it's a, it's a tough sell to, sometimes, depending on what your fee is for an inlay, because cost difference can be considerable. Uh, in my practice, uh, an MO composite's probably about $230. 
uh, and inlay is about $900. So there's a considerable bump in fee there. Um, and it's just a matter of, you know, a lot of, every patient's different. Some of them really value um, getting the highest quality of whatever it is that they're, they're getting. And those are the types of patients that you can, you can do inlays on. Um, if, if you have patients who are price shopping, you know, who uh, really want to find the, the best deal on their dental care, then they're probably not going to be the ones to do uh, inlays. And occlusion is very important. Obviously, we know this in, in all facets of dentistry, but particularly for indirect restorations, it's important to know what the status of the occlusion is really before you get started. And so I generally check the occlusion uh, directly after I get the patient numb because I wanna know where the occlusion is so I can start to envision where my margins are going to be. Very important rule for indirect restorations is you do not want the margin of your restoration within a millimeter of an occlusal contact, okay? Studies show that this greatly uh, speeds up the demise of your restoration. It, it causes can cause fracturing at those marginal areas. Those marginal areas tend to be the thinnest part of your ceramic, uh, but it also causes certain flexure among the ceramic that in, uh, speeds up the, the bonding degradation. So a couple of reasons. Um, and you're also, so that's one reason. You wanna keep your margins away from the occlusal context. The other reason is you want to know what type of force has been placed on those cusps over time. So this is where you start to get into the critical thinking part of things. You wanna know, is this cusp going to be strong enough to keep for a long time, right? We, we expect 10 to 15 year longevity at least out of these restorations. We need the restoration to hold up, but we also need the tooth structure to hold up as well. And so this is a way you can kind of predict um, what kind of stress that tooth structure has been under. And if we look at this uh, example on the screen, um, you can see that the with the occlusal marks on the outer portion of that buccal cusp, this tends to put the cusp in compression. So it pushes that um, cusp back towards the middle of the tooth where it is supported, okay? This is a good thing, all right? Compression, cusp and compression tend to, tend to fare very well. On the contrary to that, cusps in tension tend not to fare very well. So for one thing, if you see your occlusal marks are close to your where your anticipated finish line will be, um, that's going to be a problem along that occlusal surface. You may need to either do a small occlusal adjustment on the opposing tooth or kind of re-plan your preparation to move those margins uh, maybe a little bit further buckly um, just to get them out of the way of the occlusion, get the occlusion all on the restoration. The other aspect of this is if you look at how those, uh, when those occlusal marks are on the inner inclines of the cusp, they tend to push the cusps away from the tooth. Um, this is putting a cusp in tension and that tends to be bad, okay? That tends to cause fractures. Um, and generally, if a cusp is in tension and shows some signs of wear from that tension, uh, it's not a bad idea to be conservative and go ahead and cover that cusp um, just to make sure that five years, three years, seven years down the road that that cusp isn't going to fracture on you um, and cause failure of that restoration. The other thing is thickness of the remaining tooth structure, right? So this is important as well. Uh, two millimeters is really the number that you're looking for here and you're measuring it at the base where it connects to the pulpal floor. That cusp needs to be uh, supported by dentin. That's a very important part of this. I always say two to three because uh, I teach dental students and they don't necessarily know exactly what two millimeters looks like. Uh, it's not a bad idea to have a, a digital caliper around if you're a little hazy on what two millimeters looks like clinically to just go ahead and measure. But two millimeters of healthy uh, cusp is strong enough to support uh, an inlay or an onlay uh, in a dental restoration. There's actually a study coming out of North Carolina very soon, uh, and they found basically two millimeters is kind of that magic number as far as uh, what thickness of tooth structure you're able to leave. So looking at that same case, uh, prepped everything out. 
Uh, here we are marking the margins. Um, it is very important when you're in the software to orient, to get your orientation correct. So when you look down on your preparation, your orientation should be your path of draw. So you should be able to look down uh, right into that preparation and see all the walls around your preparation because remember for indirect restorations we need divergent walls right 10 degrees of divergent walls this is kind of the opposite of an amalgam prep right amalgam is held in by convergent walls we need divergent walls so with that divergence we're straight down the path of draw you should be able to see down all of these walls okay like you can for the most part in this prep lose it a little bit here but for the most part, everywhere we can see those divergent walls. And that is going to guarantee that your restoration will seat, all right, and not have any undercuts. That's a very important thing. I will say that, that often I will get to this point where I'm marking my margin on my preparation and I will notice that I didn't taper a wall enough, okay? And I will just quickly go back, refine my prep, rescan, because it's worth, the extra five minutes that it takes to make sure that that my restoration will seat and I don't have to sit there and grind on it. All right, it's easy. A lot of times it's easier to see that uh, on a scan than it is uh, in the patient's mouth. All right, so as we zoom in, we look at these, um, you know, these are, these are kind of classic inlays. If you look at the premolar, you might say that, that lingual cusp on the premolar looks a little bit less than two millimeters. You'd probably be right. I always say that doing partial coverage is um, kind of a test of your uh, ability to handle risk, right? Um, and I've been doing partial coverage for long enough now to be able to predict pretty well, I think, um, which cusps I can keep and which I, can, um, I, can, I have to cover. Uh, in this case, the occlusion probably dictated a good part of why I kept that uh, lingual cusp. Here are the restorations design. The design in this is, is very straightforward. Um, actually, the software does a really nice job of doing most of the design work for you. Um, and then here they are delivered. This is immediately after delivery. We still have a little bit of cleanup to do, but um, we always use high translucency um, materials. And those high translucency materials, because of the size of these preps, tend to blend in uh, to the tooth structure a little bit better. So keep that in mind. If you're using Emacs and HT Emacs or a medium translucency, if you don't want to stock a bunch of high translucencies, works, works pretty well. Here's another case we did in our student clinic. Uh, we had a, a failing um, class two composite. Um, took it out, student prepped it, scanned it, designed it. Here it is. You can see these beautiful, beautiful restorations. Um, this was Emacs bonded in. You can see the, um, the post-op radiograph, the, the margins look great on these. So the scanner is able to capture the margins. Um, you just need to give it a, a nice divergent prep. Now, I don't particularly love premolar inlays. It's such a small prep um, that, I, that, once again, I find it hard. Um, a lot of times to deliver these because they're so tiny. Um, I prefer molars. Most of the inlays that I do, honestly, are on, are on molars. One of the things that I wanted to talk about, and I talked a little bit about this, is your, is your insertion axis and making sure that when you're doing this step that you're taking a little bit of extra time to make sure that you're looking straight down over, um, over the prep to make sure that you can see all those walls. Um, it's worth a little bit of extra time to make sure that you're nailing that step. And I had a video of that, but it wasn't working, so I just decided to, to take it out. So that's inlays. Like I said, inlays are, are great, um, but they can be a little difficult to um, convince a patient to, to do. Um, we certainly have some patients who, who always want the best dentistry, and those are the patients that are always on board to do an inlay. Um, onlays, I think, are a bigger opportunity for us to convert some of those larger composites. Once again, larger composites are basically long-term temporaries. The material just doesn't hold up well uh, long-term. And so we need to make sure, we, it's, we have an opportunity basically to, to educate our patients as to how these materials perform and to maybe um, you know, upgrade their restoration to, to an onlay. 
<clears throat> and bonded onlays have a very good longevity. I mean, 90% at 10 years, once again, this is a mixture of materials um, looked at over the years. I think this number would be higher um, with Emacs because you're not gonna have issues with uh, fracture. Um, but there are some suggestions. These aren't rules necessarily, but if you're just starting in partial coverage, this, these are good suggestions to kind of follow. And we talked a little bit about a few of these and I'll go through them. Um, the one thing I want to, to talk about is the very last one is preserving enamel. Avoid putting margins at or near the gum line. All right. And I feel like this is something that that we talk about all the time when we do um, more conservative full coverage preparations. People will have like a, like a little NCCL, a non-carious cervical lesion, an abfractive lesion at the gum line on a patient that we're doing a, or that needs a, a full coverage restoration. And student or even some of our instructors are always like, why didn't you just drop the margin all the way down and in, in, into that non-carious cervical lesion? And the reason is, the gum line is the dirtiest place in the mouth, right? When patients brush their teeth, the, the spot they're most likely to miss is the gum line. Uh, the other thing is we don't have enamel down there to bond to. We're, we're basically anchoring our restoration onto dentin or cementum. Um, and, and chances are very good. We had to remove a lot of additional healthy tooth structure in order to get that margin down to the gum line. So once again, there is there is no rule that says that a margin needs to be near the gum line. Matter of fact, it's better off the, the higher it is. We usually shoot for the height of contour in most cases for where we want to put those uh, margins. So cusp thickness, I said two millimeters, right? Two millimeters is a good thing to shoot for. Um, there's a lot of uh, more, good, good data out there that states two millimeters and we have uh, even some new studies that are coming out looking at this as well. Once again, needs to be supported by dentin. Very important to check the occlusion uh, before you start your procedure, just to know where that patient is hitting on the tooth you're working on. Uh, one thing I will point out is sometimes once you get the old restoration out, and that's always the first step, is you need to look at the health of the tooth. In this particular case, and I got this off of Google Images, just you know, years ago, I've been showing this tooth for years, uh, but you can you can see a little fracture right at the base of that cusp. If you see something like that, this cusp needs to be covered. Clearly, it is not 100% healthy and strong and not one that you want to rely on for a restoration that you hope is gonna last 10 to 15 years. All right, so let's look at some cases. So looking at this first molar, we have a big, really beautifully well done uh, amalgam here uh, that needs to be replaced. That's some, some recurrent caries. So first thing is always to take the old restoration out and remove the decay, all right? And that way you can see what kind of tooth structure you have left. Now thinking through the rules that we have, okay? We have a cusp here that is less than two millimeters. We had occlusion on the inner incline of this cusp, putting that cusp in tension and remember, you always, if you have a proximal surface involved, you always want to break that contact. Very, very important um, for, for several reasons. Uh, the most important, I think, is that the scanner just cannot pick up the margin. Uh, no intraoral scanner can pick up the margin when you haven't broken contact. It just tends to meld those two surfaces together. So it's very difficult to mark a margin in those instances. Um, so this is what that prep looked like. Now, look at the buckle on the lingual surfaces. Look how much enamel we have at the height of contour. All right, remember the further you go down, height of contour is where the thickest amount of enamel is. As you go closer and closer to the tissue, all right, that enamel band gets thinner and thinner. And sometimes we have to do that. But if we can, if we can create a thick band of enamel and then bond to it effectively, we're gonna have a really, really durable restoration. All right, here, this is the old, old version of the software. Here we are marking our margins, our design. And then this was back when all we had was low translucency Emacs, um, but still, still looks pretty good. So let's go through another case of step-by-step. Step. All right, first thing we need to do is remove the old restoration, check the occlusion, all right? Chances are good you're gonna have decay underneath that. You can get rid of that as well, but you need to know where the occlusion is because you need to start 
kind of picturing where what the outline form of that restoration is going to be. Okay, you're going to remove the decay and then you're going to go through those those rules, right? Keep the margin away from the contact. Is the cusp thick enough? Um, looking at whether the cusp has been in tension or compression, all those rules that we talked about. Okay, then you can start designing your preparation. We generally use a uh, kind of a tapered cylinder like this with a rounded end on it. These are really, really nice burrs. Um, perfect for inlays and onlays. They give you exactly the taper that you need. Um, and I actually think that a, I like a little bit more than 10 degrees of taper because I want to be absolutely sure that that restoration is going to seat. Um, your hand skills are probably better than mine, so you can probably get away with, with going at 10 degrees. But I, I am for sure certain that I want um, a little bit more extra taper. And then I go over with the same shape, but just a fine version of it to make sure that everything is smooth. Really important to have smooth finish lines and margins, and then we can scan and begin the workflow of um, our CAD CAM system. All right, so that is onlays. Let's look at one more, and I have a video in here that I'm gonna skip for time purposes, but this is a, a first and a second molar that both have really large uh, composites with uh, failing restorations on it. And I wanted to go through uh, if this will work for us and just really quick talk about, yeah, how to work with a rubber dam, all right? Because a lot of times I put a rubber dam on to prep and I don't want to take it off uh, for scanning. And so I will scan as soon as the patient gets numb. So while the patient's getting numb, I will scan the opposing arch and this is the Emerald S scanner. Uh, I don't get to use this very often. Wally basically has this in his possession most, most days. So I have to like steal it off of him in order to get to use it. Um, then I scan the bite um, and you scan the bite. You don't, you don't really need the tooth that has the rubber dam clamp on it in your bite scan. You can scan first molar through canine and have enough information for the computer to to, to um, align everything for the bite. Then you put your rubber dam on and you do your preps. And then you go back and you can scan your preps with the rubber dam on. And generally this will have enough information now to allow the computer to kind of put everything together. Taking those HD snapshots with the scanner to make sure we have good uh, visibility of our margins. This is using the paint feature to mark those margins. Paint is fantastic for um, inlays and onlays. It's basically finding the margin for you and it does most of the work and you just need to to tweak generally the inner proximal areas. And their restorations are all designed and there they are after delivery. Once again, high translucency Emacs uh, looks really, really pretty on these teeth. Um, and then check, double check your occlusion and make sure that you're not getting occlusal marks that are anywhere near your restoration. Once again, it's a really important part of doing these is controlling the forces that are gonna be placed on these restorations, uh, making sure, and most of this can be done in the design phase, um, but making sure that those um, occlusal marks are either wholly on to structure or wholly on your restoration. Now, sometimes I will find that I get started doing an onlay. And in fact, what I find is enough uh, destruction of tooth structure where I need to do something full coverage. And so I wanted to briefly talk about the overlay or the crown lay, because um, these, are, these are more conservative options for your, for your crown preparations. The crown lay is what we teach our students here. Crown lay is more like your traditional crown prep in that you actually have axial walls. And it's nice for beginners. Uh, people who are just starting into doing more conservative restorations because it allows you to have a po more positive seat on that crown. Um, as I've been doing these for a few years, my technique has morphed a little bit more to the right side of the screen. Uh, and big thanks to my friend Nate Lawson at Dental Tube for this picture of, a, of an occlusal overlay. This is a, just a really cool shot of what these preps look like. But you can see there's no axial wall. There's no real positive seat for these. So it, it tends to be a little bit more, a, a higher degree of difficulty when it comes time to deliver these restorations. So it's good to have a little experience under your belt at bonding restorations before you launch into 
these, and we've been doing these for years. The reality is, you know, we did these with gold even before I was in dental school, um, and we were putting these on with zinc phosphate, and they held up. And these uh, examples that you see on the screen are 35 years old. They've been in there forever. And there's no reason why we can't get that same kind of longevity with, with bonded Emacs. And uh, the uh, aspects of this preparation are very simple. It's smooth finish lines. You're trying to keep it right around the Haida contour when you can. Obviously, it will dip a little bit closer to the gingiva interproximally. You want minimal anatomy um, and you want everything to be very rounded and smooth. Okay. And when we look at, this is actually Iva Clark's recommendations for how to do this, this prep. And you can see very simple, right? One millimeter everywhere. But the reality is for you to get a millimeter of Emacs thickness, you actually have to do a little bit more reduction. All right. Usually around 1.2 uh, reduction will get you a millimeter of thickness. And that's because you have cement gap. And you have a phenomenon called overmilling. What overmilling means is that there are inevitably, inevitably going to be sharp edges in your preparation. Okay, this is an example of a anterior crown prep that I did, um, and when I put it into the to the uh, CAD CAM system, you're able to simulate the mill pattern, and it shows you an area where you're going to get overmill, and that is this red area right here. So what that means is that this ellipsoidal burr is the burr that mills out the intaglio surface of the crown. If you have a sharp peak in that crown, the ellipsoidal burr has to take away extra ceramic in order to make sure that that crown will seat. And what that causes is a thin piece of ceramic. This is the case for all milling machines. And so it's important, this is the importance of having a very um, round, well rounded, no pointy angles, um, no knife edge, anything on your crown preparation to make sure that the mill doesn't have to over mill and take away additional ceramic. You can see in this particular case, it really hogged out the inner portion of this crown to the extent that we actually, you can actually maybe make out this little translucent window here. Um, in the crown where it got really, really thin. So that is, that is a problem. That is something that uh, was on me. Uh, my, my prep needs to be better. Um, and it's just a matter of making sure that we have um, no, no sharp edges uh, in those preps. Now, if you do find this, you can always mill it on um, detail mode. Detail mode uses a smaller burr um, and you will get far less over milling, but it's going to take a little bit more time. All right, I don't know how I did time-wise. I think I did pretty well, Jody. Um, <laughs> sweet. All right, um, I will be posting the uh, CE survey in just a second once we get started um, with some of these questions. Uh, so just give me one second. Um, Dr. Benito, there were definitely a couple questions about one, about the, um, the dam course that you took, um, mm -hmm. and then also um, the bird number that you uh, mentioned or, uh, previously. Okay. Um, so the, the rubber dam course that I took is an online course by a guy named Kalen Pop, C-A-L-I-N-P-O-P. Uh, -I, I think it's just one P. Um, if, you, if you Google Kalen Pop rubber dam, it is, uh, you will find it. It's, it's everywhere. Since I bought it, I literally, it's, I see him, his face everywhere because the selective advertising pops up. Um, but it is a really, really good rubber dam course. Um, one of the best online courses that I've seen bar none. And it's, I think it's right around a hundred bucks to take. Um, so it is a, it is well worth the money, especially if, if rubber dam is something that you're interested. I, I personally love a rubber dam, uh, gives me peace of mind. Uh, I think once you get good at placing them, uh, it's really, it really helps speed your dentistry up uh, for sure. And actually there's a follow-up question to that. Um, is, do you register your bite with a rubber dam before the prep? Um, do I register the bite with, no, yes, before, before the prep, before the prep. Now that's a little bit different. Part, for partial coverage, you generally have most of the buccal surface intact still after you prepare the tooth, right? And even for crown lays, you still have a good portion of the buccal surface intact. And it's that information on the buccal surface that the computer is using to put your 
uh, all three of those scans together to put your prep scan, your opposing scan, and your bite all together is that data on the buckle. And so that's what, that's what enables you to do that. You just need to have a long enough span of unchanged data, so teeth that have not been prepped, um, to allow the computer to find those common points to then stitch everything together. Okay, great. Um, I'm getting a lot of comments that the CE survey link is not working, so I will uh, try and fix that in just a second. I get it. Um, is it feasible to place the occlusal contact on the restoration? Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. I, we do it all the time. All the time. You just got to make sure that you're getting even occlusion throughout the arch, right? That's really the key. And the software will show you uh, whether that's happening or not, right? And it's it's pretty accurate. You may find that you have to adjust it a little bit once uh, once the, if it's Emacs, if it's in the purple phase, you may adjust the occlusion just a little bit to get it uh, really locked in in the patient's mouth. Um, but otherwise, uh, you can absolutely rely on that that material to hold up. All right. Um... Can you give some pointers for tabletop onlays? It's a new term for me. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think this is more, let me go back a little bit, of that tabletop variety. Um, and the, the, what you're really looking for is um, you, you want, you see how this, you have this little slope, right? From the cusp tip, down to the margin, you have this little slope. And this is the part that I really like about this prep because if you know about enamel rods, what this does is it really exposes a lot of the ends of the enamel rods to, um, to, to for bonding. And it also allows the, the ceramic material to blend in a little bit better. Instead of having a butt joint like you see on the left, where it immediately goes from ceramic to tooth structure, you have this gentle, almost like a, almost like a bevel, where you can transition slowly from ceramic to tooth structure. So the aesthetics tend to be a little bit better as well. What I would recommend, and I, I find that I have to do this a lot, are composite, little flowable composite. They're not buildups, but they're more like um, you put them in to smooth out any undercuts. Uh, and to make sure that you have a nice smooth transition from cusp tip to central groove back up to cusp tip. And that's, that's an additional step that I don't, I usually don't charge for, to be honest. Um, it takes me about three minutes to put that in. Like I said, just some bonding agent on the dentin and some flowable composite, just to make sure that I have a nice smooth um, intaglio surface on, on my milled restoration. Great. Um, we have a question about um, dental uh, insurance claims. Um, mm -hmm. One uh, gentleman had a, uh, a dental insurance consultant told him to make sure to remove at least one cusp when doing a conservative prep. He had to appeal the case when, as they were neglecting to pay it. Or is this something that you're seeing um, as a common, you know, situation? And how do you overcome it? Um, so, so I have not had that. I have not had that experience. Um, I mean, you're, you're talking basically about an inlay, um, <clears throat> doing inlays and getting, getting insurance to cover inlays. If you do an onlay, by definition, you're covering one of the cusps. So, um, so that's, you know, I, I, well, once again, I find that with adequate um, documentation of the case, um, and I've gotten to the point where I know this case is going to be, you know, one that I really need to have photos of and I need, I need to, you know, make sure I have each step documented. Um, if there's a fracture in the tooth, absolutely document that. Um, th those sorts of things are very helpful. Um, I, I haven't, certainly don't have experience with every insurance company out there. And there are some I know that uh, just don't want to, they just will give you a hard time for anything really. Um, and it's unfortunate for, for those of us who have to work with those companies. But no, I think documentation and a, and a little write-up on your part um, will, will be sufficient in a vast majority of cases for those. Great, thanks. Um, and just uh, to follow up on the CE survey link, uh, we are having issues. I posted a comment in the chat. Uh, we will get our follow-up email out as quickly as possible today so that it is included in there as, along with the recording of the webinar. 
Um, great question. Uh, what courses would you suggest for learning inlays and onlays? That is a good question. So back before all this happened, uh, I used to give one of these with, with Dr. Donnie Murray um, and Are You Numb Yet? Uh, matter of fact, we, we, were gonna, we had one scheduled uh, coming up here shortly um, at, at Plan Mecca in, um, in Chicago, but uh, you know, things, things changed. Um, that is one good resource that I hope we can get back to. And I think, um, you know, I think you guys will be the first ones to know if and when those, those do get rescheduled. Um, I all honestly find uh, Instagram very helpful. There are certain people who do this type of dentistry very well. Um, and you have my Instagram information. Feel free to contact me. I can, I can kind of push you towards some, some dentists who do really great, um, you know, partial coverage restorations and conservative stuff. Um, and you, you know, you just, you learn by doing for the most part and you just have to, you, you have to know the general principles, but then at some point you just got to do it. You got to find a case that, that looks like it's a good candidate and go for it. Um, and we didn't talk about, you know, if you don't have a mill, what do you do? Uh, there are ways to temporize these restorations for sure. Uh, it can be a little bit, um, of a, of a learning curve in and of itself, but just cause you don't have a mill doesn't mean that you can't do conservative dentistry. You absolutely can. It's just a different, different set of, uh, issues that you need to deal with. Right. Um, have you ever tried the Optradam by Ivaclar? If so, what are your thoughts? This is the second time in two days I've heard about the Optradam. I have not used it. I love the Optra gate for scanning. Um, no, but I, I clearly I'm missing out on something. Um, I actually heard about it three times in the past two days. I was watching an Iva Clar webinar last night, and um, and one of the participants in that uh, talked about how much she loved that product. Um, I have not used it. Apparently, it's it's a simplified version of of the rubber dam, and so I don't know much about it. But it's something that I'm definitely going to give a, tr a try. I've been I've been struggling. You know, with rubber dam, just like everybody else, uh, till the point where I got pretty good at it. Um, but I'm always, I'm always open for trying some new things. Cool. See, we're all learning. Uh, what do you recommend for a patient who has a heavy bite or a grinding habit? So you know, you it's once again, it's a cl clinical decision on your part. I, I think I, I don't change my material. For that, I, I don't think zirconia is going to give me any sort of advantage. What I do know about all ceramic materials is thickness equals strength, right? So instead of doing a one millimeter prep, maybe I prep a little bit more aggressively to a millimeter and a half for a patient that I know is going to challenge that ceramic. But bonded Emax at a millimeter and a half is as strong, I promise you, as zirconia. And if it's bonded well, it, it's not going to fracture on you. It's not going to fracture. You just got to make sure you're handling the Emacs. I, I know of a lot of people who think that they need to sandblast their Emacs to get a good bond. And the manufacturer, you know, maybe that does help the bond strength, but it, it's been shown to weaken the ceramic as well. So, um, so you had to make sure that you're handling the material properly as well. Make sure you're not weakening it. Uh, over time but yeah if you have if you have somebody who you know is a crusher uh, and needs a stronger material uh, absolutely just prep a little bit more aggressively get some so a millimeter and a half of thickness for that emacs and then bond it in place and, and you will be in good shape and what's your instagram handle sorry it is a smile professor i had it on that last slide uh but i went back to that prep so smile professor is my instagram handle all right. And I like to, I, you know, I like to show a lot of what we're doing at the school. So you'll see some student cases. You'll see some of my stuff. Um, yeah, it's a lot of digital dentistry. Cool. Um, are most of your intraoral pictures taken by the scanner itself or with a camera? So I take most of them <clears throat> with my with my camera with my DSLR. Um, being that I'm in education, I, I need high quality photos for slides and things like that. So the DSLR gives me a, a really nice uh, picture. You can take HD snapshots with uh, the Emerald and the Emerald S, uh, and those actually look look pretty nice. It's, they save right in Romexis to the to the 2D file, um, so that's an option as well. Um, once again, I just need I need I need pretty pictures, right, for, for my slides. So I tend to break out my big camera for that. Now, will that continue now that I have to, you know, take all my 
take all the PPE off. I don't know how I'm going to take pictures with all that, the face shield and everything. So I'm going to have to relearn um, that process and figure out how that's all going to work. Cool. Um, can you uh, give a little bit of insight to your bonding technique? Absolutely. So uh, once again, I, I am a fan of self-etch adhesives. Uh, if you look at the literature in a self-etch adhesive, a two bottle system, so a clear fill SE, what we would have called a sixth generation adhesive, uh, is really kind of the best that you can do uh, with a selective etch technique on enamel. Once again, I use Adhes Universal. Um, that's what we teach our students because that tends to be where the market is moving as far as trends in sales of adhesives and we're trying to prepare our students for the real world. Um, so we're using a universal adhesive and so, you know, isolation, making sure the tooth is perfectly clean. There's, there's several ways you can do that. If you have an intraoral sandblaster, that's, that's the best way to get a nice clean preparation right before bonding. Um, selective etch of the enamel for 15 seconds, rinse it off, get it dry, and then using the, uh, the Adhes Universal, um, usually we'll use a couple of coats of that just to get a nice, a little bit of a thicker, because it's got a very thin, adhesive layer um, and so we, we usually will use a couple coats of that thin it out cure it and then of course you have to treat your emac so uh, hydrofluoric acid for 15 seconds or 20 seconds and then silane for a minute uh, and then we use a uh, variolink aesthetic uh, dual cure resin cement um, to to bond those into place so um, that's in a nutshell what we do. Um, it's a two-person job for sure to, to bond on. Uh, one person keeps the restoration in place. The other one either uh, tack cures it and then cl cleans up around the edges or uses a micro brush to, to get the excess cement off prior to curing um, that restoration. All right. Um, any tips for um, small inlay restorations on premolars uh, to help with placement during the bonding? Yeah, so I I have used a couple of different strategies, but it's you know they have those little um, they they look like micro brush handles with this with a little sticky wax on the end, uh, and you basically can pick it up from from that. So I will I will try it in the mouth, and then I will come in with one of those um, to pick it up out of the tooth, right? So I have the correct orientation. Keep it on that brush to do. Um, my uh, hydrofluoric acid and silane step, um, being very careful, you always cover the drain of whatever you're, if you're working around a sink, cover the drain of the sink because Lord knows if it falls off into the sink, it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, ask me how I know. Um, and so we've got to be really, really careful with that. Some other options are, you know, the, there's blue block out uh, resin that comes uh, with white, when you make whitening trays, you put it on the model for the whitening tray. Sometimes I will just take a quick tip, a normal micro brush, um, put it on top of the occlusal surface, squirt a little of that blue resin around it, cure it for five seconds, and you've got kind of a, a poor man's um, caring tip for inlays as well. But the, one of those two, uh, would be the, the method that I would recommend. Uh, the Adhes Universal that you mentioned, who is, uh, do you know who makes that? Who's the manufacturer? Yeah, that is an Ivaclar product. So I always recommend using, if you're using, if you have a uh, resin cement that you like, find an adhesive made by the same manufacturer, right? So that's basically what we did. Uh, we love Verilink Aesthetic. I think it's a really good resin cement. Uh, Adhes Universal is, is the adhesive that Ivaclar makes. Uh, and so if you look at the data, um, generally pairing those two materials from the same manufacturer gives you better results. So we like the cement, so we went out and we bought the adhesive and we use those two together. Right. There's a lot of other good options out there as well though. I like Panavia V5 a lot. I've used that um, quite a few. Uh, we used um, Optibon XTR and uh, Nexus 3 from Kerr and got really good results from that for years. There's a lot of good combos out there. I'm not, not saying that the Ivaclar one is the only one. It uh, just happens to be the one we're currently using. <clears throat> a 
Other than relying on the bonding technique, how do you prevent an onlay to debond from occlusal forces, mainly on the functional cusps? That is a, a question asked by, um, so the, the reality is you don't, you don't have anything. It's, it's 100% bonded. It's 100% bonded and that's all you need. And that's the hard, that's the thing that you, you have to get over, right? There's this trust issue, like people don't necessarily trust bonding. And that's why I talked about how to, how to bond really well and the importance of isolation and all those other things, because those are all really important because you're relying on each aspect of your dentistry to go perfectly. And if that's the case, your, the bond will hold up. It will, I promise, it will hold up. You may think you like you need, you know, more than just the bond, like belts and suspenders, but you don't, I promise. Um, if you have a ton of enamel and you, and you etch the enamel and you have good adhesive and you keep everything dry and you use the proper uh, preparation of your ceramic, it will work. It will work. It's a bit of a leap of faith though if you've not done it before because we're used to retention form. We're used to resistance form. These are difficult things to, to let go of, right? It's that mindset. And so if you're, not, if you're not comfortable with it, don't go all in. Just do a case here and there, right? And build that comfort level up slowly. Nothing wrong with that. All right. Uh, when refining the prep after seeing the scan, do you only need to rescan the occlusal or do you need to redo the buckle scan as well? So there is a tool within the software that allows you to erase selective parts of your scan, right? So anywhere where you have to refine your prep, you just take the little eraser tool, you erase that portion, and then you just go back in and scan. And it's literally a three second scan to fill that data back in. Um, so it actually is really quick and efficient to do that, which is which is why I d never hesitate to do it. It it, it happens uh, very quickly. You can get it done literally within just it sets you back maybe two minutes or three minutes, um, and it's well worth it in the end. You just erase the portion of the tooth that you refined and rescan that portion. And what is the margin ramp setting that you use for designing onlays and inlays in PlanCAD? I knew I was going to get this question. So mm -hmm. I don't mess with the margin ramp. I, I, for only for veneers do I mess with the margin ramp, but I know a lot of people who do. So the default margin ramp setting for an inlay is 0.25, okay? Um, and I find because I put enough divergence, right, on my preps, I don't have generally any issues with binding, okay? However, if you're not 100% comfortable with your preparation, you think you need a little bit more leeway, Okay, you can drop that, um, that margin ramp setting. Um, and some of the numbers that I've heard have been as low as 0 0.05 for that. And what, what the margin ramp is, is, is how much ceramic is actually contacting the tooth. The more you have contacting the tooth, the greater chance that that restoration could bind along an axial wall where the, the prep is not uh, exactly ideal. So the larger that number, the greater the chance of binding on an inlay and an onlay. So yeah, like I said, it, it, it's, I keep it at 0.25 because I put, a, I put a decent amount of taper on my internal walls. Um, if you're a little anxious about that, you can drop it down as low as 0 0.05 uh, for that margin ramp. Um, and what do you use to clean the excess bonding and polish? Good question. So <clears throat> we use, uh, we have Brassler, uh, we have a, basically all Brassler burrs and they have a, an Emacs polishing uh, kit that uh, comes with that. So I will use what's called an ET burr, which is basically a flame shaped composite finishing burr to remove any little residual of um, resin cement that might be on that preparation. And then I will go over it with um, just those Emacs polishers. Um, to finish it off. There's, there's two steps. There's a yellow and a red, um, and that gives a very, very smooth finish. I will occasionally, if I'm not happy with a margin, so if I have a little bit of a step in a margin, I will take a fine diamond and just finish that margin slightly and then go back over it with the um, Emacs polishers. Awesome. These are called Dialyte LDs, I believe. LD for lithium disilicate. Great. 
All right, we are going to wrap it up. Uh, I, unfortunately, we could not get to all of the questions today, but um, just a reminder, we will send out a post webinar email um, very shortly with the CE survey link and the recording. Um, any final words of wisdom, Dr. Menito, for those uh, ready to tackle this? Like I said, if, if, if find me on Instagram, if you have any questions, shoot me, shoot me a direct message on Instagram, but, but I, I know that initially it can be difficult uh, to, to make the leap from retention form to complete bonding, um, but do it in baby steps. And if, if you have any problems, reach out to me. I'll try to help you as best I can. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you all for joining. Uh, keep a lookout for our upcoming webinars. Uh, with the road back into the office, we won't be uh, offering at the same frequency that we have been for the last six or seven weeks. But um, please keep an eye out because we're, uh, we're definitely, you know, aiming to keep everybody educated and informed the best that we can, uh, knowing that uh, travel to courses and education is going to be limited over the next few months. So again, thank you all for joining. Dr. Benito, thank you so much for your time. Take care and have a good afternoon and a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.